Can we just ooh. can we uh, just mute the uh, audio off that computer? Thank you so much. I want to tell you a story this morning, and again, if you have your Bibles open to that Numbers 22, I want to invite you to follow along. I'm not going to read every uh, verse that's there in uh, the text, but I do want to kind of walk you through uh, the story because it is, while it is kind of a long story, it is a very, very unique story and fascinating story, and I want us to hear the whole story, and then I want us to reflect on what's happening in the story and see what God might be speaking to us here this morning. So the story begins with Israel, if you recall, if you've been with us for these last months, has traveled through the wilderness, and the very, very beginning of the text tells us that they're kind of at the end geographically of this journey. And there's a king, his name is Balak. I know it's weird, so let's just go ahead and say that out loud to get it over with. Ready, everybody? One, two, three. Balak. Okay, this time let's say it and let's put a tremendous amount of spit and saliva and all that on the end of the word so we can sound Hebrew. Ready? Here we go. Ready? The word is Balak. Okay, so there's this king, and he's actually heard, one way or another, about all the things that God has done for this traveling nomadic group, these Israelites. He had seen what Israel, what this group had done along the way against their enemies. And so he sends messengers to a, um, we'll just kind of call him a diviner, or uh, we could call him a prophet, but I don't want you to think that he's like a prophet from Israel. He's like a guy that you know, people hire, basically, to kind of tell them what's going to happen. And maybe even they even pay the guy to actually tell them what they want to hear, like that kind of thing. A seer, uh, a prophet, a diviner, one of those kind of people. And let's actually say his name uh, at least one time correctly, and then who, who knows how I'll say it the rest of the time. But let's just say Balaam, okay? Bala and then Am. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Balaam. One more time because now you're really good. Ready? One, two, three. Balaam. Okay, Balaam has been hired by Balak, or he wants to hire him anyway, to basically curse this nomadic group that the king, Balak, has heard about. He's like, I want to pay this guy to basically curse this people because I'm scared to death of them because I've seen what they've already done. They're, the text tells us, too powerful for him. And so he wants to pay, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, an oligarch purchasing an army. Maybe that's happening somewhere in the world today. I don't know if you watch the news. That might sound familiar to you. But an oligarch, uh, um, a uh, supreme commander, paying an army to fight for them. He wants to offer a fee so he can win his battles. So kind of the second part of the story, if you're following along with us there in Numbers 22, and by the way, we're going to be going from Numbers 22 by the end of the day all the way through chapter 24. So those are the chapters that we're going to be covering quickly. Balaam tells the messengers that are sent from Balak, you know, spend the night and I'll see what the Lord says. By the way, it's not capitalized on your screen, but very interesting that somehow or another, Balaam, this non-Jewish prophet guy, actually uses the name Yahweh when he speaks back to these messengers. He's familiar enough with the Jewish people, with these Israelis, that he actually uses the name of their God. He says, I'll see what Yahweh says. Spend the night, I'll see what Yahweh says, and I'll report it back to you. Really interesting that this fear that Balak the king has just kind of shows God's power. It's like a testimony to what God has already done through his people. Okay, so overnight... God speaks to Balaam and basically tells him a very simple message. Israel, these people that you are have been hired to curse, 
they're actually a blessed people. It's like literally the opposite of what Balak wants Balaam to do. God says, no, 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 no. You're not going to curse these people because they are blessed. So the morning comes. Balaam wakes up. He tells the messengers from Balak, hey, man, go back because Yahweh has refused to let me go with you. These people that you want me to curse, I can't curse them. God's already blessed them. End of story. So if you're following along there in the text in Numbers 22, the messengers go back to Balak, and Balak hears their report, gets a little more angry, and sends back more messengers and like more prestigious messengers back to Balaam and says, dude, maybe you didn't get the message the first time. I have money. And I want to give it to you if you will just come and curse my enemies. Sounds like a fairly good deal if you're Balaam. The messengers come back to Balaam. And the message this time is, Balaam, don't let anything stop you. The message from the king is that he will pay you Handsomely, I love that word. I, I put it on the screen. I, I, instead of making it simple, I just think that's a beautiful word. He will pay you handsomely. Sounds like we're in Shakespeare. Okay. Balaam responds back, even if Balak gave me all the money in his entire palace, I can't do anything beyond what God commands. I, I can go and try to pray, but whatever God says is what I have to say to you. But spend the night and I'll see what else God says while you're sleeping. Next morning, everybody wakes up. The bed and breakfast is open. God says to Balaam, in the middle of the night, go with them as they've requested, but only do what I tell you to do. So Balaam goes with the messengers if you know this part of the story, it's a wild one. God speaks to Balaam through a donkey. Read the story for some more details. He sends an angel that blocks the path of the animal and kind of pushes the animal off to the side and has to use extraordinary measures to get the attention of this seer, of this diviner, literally speaks through a donkey, and here's the message. Balaam, your path is reckless. I basically, I've already told you what the deal is here. The people that you're hired to curse, they're blessed. And yeah, I said you could go, but something must have been off in Balaam's mind and his heart and his plans because the angel comes and basically gets in his way and says, you are on a reckless path. i got to pause right here. How many of you have ever been in a moment in your life when somebody or God himself told you you were on a reckless path? If you ever felt that, I want you to feel it right now because I want you to feel kind of what Balaam may have been feeling. Let me give me a pause. I'm going to be quiet for a minute. Somebody came and told you, God told you something, you were on a reckless path. What does that feel like? And imagine if it was an angel that told you the message. That was a commercial break, and now we'll continue. So, maybe you've done something like this when you felt like you were kind of on the wrong path. Balaam says, basically, hey, hey, hey I, I get the message. God, if you're displeased, I, I'll go back. But, of course, he's already left with the messengers, and the angel basically says, go ahead and go, but only do what God tells you to do, period. So, Balak says to Balaam, when he gets there, why didn't you come when I called you? Man, didn't you hear I got lots of money and I want to pay you to do the thing you're already really good at doing? How come you didn't come? And I love Balaam's uh, response. Hey, man, I'm here now, but just so you know, I can only say what God tells me to say. I just want to give you a little bit of a, a foreshadowing here. That's all I can do. So Balak and Balaam go up to this place and they do some religious things of the day and God speaks to Balaam and Balaam tells Balak, 
God gave me a message. And here it is. How can I, Balaam, curse those God hasn't cursed? I told you all I could do is just tell you whatever it is that God told me, and that's what He told me. And you can imagine Balak's response, right? Dude, I brought you here to curse my enemies, and you're blessing them? What's wrong with you, man? Don't you know I hired you for a job, and you are literally doing the opposite of the thing that I'm paying you or that I want to pay you to do. And so you're going to kind of get this message over and over again from this non-Jewish, non-Israeli dude. He says again, man, all I can do is speak what God speaks, period. So then, Balak says, okay, let's try this again. Let's go to a different spot. Let's set up all of our ritual stuff and get everything ready to go. Maybe this time, you'll be able to do what I'm asking you to do. So God, once again, speaks to Balaam. Balaam goes back to Balak and says, man, this is the message I hear. It's going to kind of remind you of the last message I already gave you. But the Lord is with these people. The message I'm getting here is that, man, see what God has done. Like, that's literally the message I'm getting. The message I'm getting is a message of blessing. The message I'm getting of this people can't be cursed because God is literally with them. Now, you can imagine, again, Balak's response. He says back to Balaam, okay, just don't curse him, don't bless him, just stop. That's like too much. And you know Balaam's response, right? Everybody knows it already. He basically says, hey, I can only do what God says for me to do. So then a third time, one final time, they kind of go through the whole thing again. Balak takes him to another place. They do all the ritual stuff, ready to go. And once again, God speaks to Balaam. And Balaam tells the king, here's the message that I got from God as I prayed. The reality of this people is this. Those that they bless are going to be blessed, and those that they curse are going to be cursed. Like, that's how much God is with them, and there's nothing I or you or anybody else can do about it. That is literally the reality of these people that you are scared to death of. And Balak says to Balaam, I summoned you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them three times. And just so you know, the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. In other words, that money I promised you, forget that, dude. I'm not giving you anything because you did the opposite of what I summoned you to do. And Balaam reminds Balak what I just mentioned to you a few moments ago. Did I not tell your messengers back where, I, where they met me in the first time that even if Balak gave me all the money in his palace, I can only do what God says. I want to just show you one artist's rendering of this event. You have Balaam there praying, prophesying over the situation, and you have Balak there seated, kind of like, you know, sulking because of the messages that he's hearing and, and so forth. We'll talk more about how this story gets brought up in a couple of moments, but I just want to point you back to this slide that we looked at just a moment ago because a couple of chapters later in a book called Joshua, Joshua reminds the people of this story, and he says, Balak, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel, and he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. I love this. But I, God speaking, I was not willing to listen to Balaam, so he had to bless you, and I delivered you from his hand. Just the power of God, as Joshua retells the story. In Deuteronomy, 
the story gets retold again. And here's how the Deuteronomist says it. Nevertheless, the Lord your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. So what you just witnessed in the retelling of this story is a God who loved and had chosen his people, and it didn't matter who wanted them to be cursed or defeated, he was with them, and they were blessed. And speaking of blessing, I want you to look at this slide that we saw just a moment ago. Because some of you who have been reading the Bible for maybe some years, or some of you decades of reading the Bible, that little phrase that I put up on the screen to kind of summarize this part of Numbers 22-24, uh, through 24, where Balaam comes out of his prayer time and says, hey man, this is the reality. May those who bless you be blessed. May those who curse you be cursed. That's the message I'm speaking over this people. That might remind you of some other time in the Bible. Remember, this is only the fourth book of the Bible, so I'm asking you to go backwards before Numbers. You might remember a time in the Bible where we heard a very similar expression about this idea of God's people those they bless will bless them, those they curse will curse. Listen to the very first time that God came and spoke to Abraham. This is Genesis chapter 12. You might remember that God comes and speaks to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17. We, the theologians call this the Abrahamic covenant. So just that word Abraham and the word covenant. God makes a covenant, a promise, a very ritualistic arrangement with this random person, seemingly random person out of this random people, or maybe not even a people. He's just a kind of a nomad. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Before Abraham did anything to earn God's favor, I'm going to make you into a, Genesis 12, great nation. This one dude into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great, so great that we're still saying it today in 2023 in the United States of America. And you will be a blessing. Listen up, Genesis 12, verse 3. I will, look on the screen, I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And we can't explain all that right now, but I want you to see the relationship between the people of God and others and the blessing and the cursing. That this is God's chosen special people. And how wild is it that this guy who doesn't even belong to these Jewish people, who's this paid prophet guy, literally speaks the things that God had told Abraham so many years before. And just so you know, in these ancient times, this idea of blessings and cursing, when you talk in that kind of language, it was a done deal. Like It wasn't like, you know, oh, a blessing. No, no. If you're blessed, you are blessed. If you're cursed, you are cursed. That's why Balak's willing to pay a bunch of money to make sure that his enemies get cursed, because this was like the final deal if you had a blessing or a cursing pronounced on you. Now, back to the artist rendering. I want to give you a moment before I say any more words. I want to give you just a moment to reflect on what you think God may be speaking through the story. I haven't really done much interpreting for you yet. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the scripture tells us the Holy Spirit is living in you and can speak to you. And I want to just give you a moment of silence, not to just sit here and, you know, fall asleep, but to just say, Lord, what might you be speaking? And I'm going to give you a couple of leading questions to kind of help you reflect. So you can look at the picture if that helps. You can remember all those slides I put up, maybe a couple of words that you saw on the slides, or just remember the story, whatever is helpful. You can open up your Bibles and read it again, scan through it again. But here's the first kind of guiding question. What do you learn about God from this story? I'm not asking you what it means for your life. Please don't go there yet. It's really critical that we always start with the main character of the story, which is not Balaam, it's not Balak, it's God himself. What did you learn about God from
from this story? I'm not going to tell you the answer. I'm asking you to just reflect for a moment. If you've got a pen, you can write something down. If you've got your phone, if you can resist the temptation to use it for other things, you can start typing some stuff. Or just let the Lord lead your thoughts. What did you learn about God from this story? If you're feeling awkward because of silence, I want you just to say to you again, the Holy Spirit can speak to you. And so don't worry about feeling awkward. Just say, Lord, what, what did I learn about you in this story? You are capable of fantastic insight. Even if it seems very simple and basic to you, that doesn't matter. Just ask the question, what did I learn about God from this story? Now, you're welcome just to keep thinking about that or writing or, you know, typing about that for a moment. But if you're ready for another leading question, I'm not asking about you in this next question. So just hear, the, hear what I'm asking. What do you learn about people from this story? Not you. What do you learn about people from Numbers 22, 23, and 24 from the story that we just told? What do you learn about people Again, keep going down that track if it's helpful. I'll have one more leading question for you, which is, what did you learn about God's blessing from this story? Let me, let me repeat those last three words, from this story. Not what did you already know about that. From this story, what did you learn about God's blessing? Let me pause right here and just say there's a group that's meeting today at 1230. If you can like what we've done for the past minute or two and you, you, you think to yourself, Man, I would love just to talk a little bit more about kind of what I'm thinking or maybe you're thinking, I have no idea and I'd love to hear what the person next to me is saying about this. It's today at 1230, is that right? Okay, right over here on this part of the building. Just go grab some food and bring it back and just sit around a table from, with some other people, just regular people like yourself, and just let's just talk about what God spoke to you during this message. Let me just say that is one of the most productive things you can do. If you're going to sit up and listen to me talk for a half an hour about something, it's a lot more chance that it'll do something in your life if you discuss it with somebody else. So, of course, you could do it anytime this week, but what are the chances with the busyness of life that you're going to do that at some other time this week? Why not come back for a couple of minutes today and join those who are already planning to do that? 
and just share and, and speak. So because of what time it is, I'm going to let you do that then. I, actually, I really would actually love to hear everybody's thoughts about your insights. But for now, because of our time, let me just simply encourage you to bring to your mind one last time what you thought about, what did you learn about God? What did you learn about people? And what did you learn about God's blessing? And I'm going to ask you if you you feel comfortable doing so before we move on, would you just pick the answer to one of those questions? And if you're near enough to somebody and you have the willingness to do this, would you just verbalize one of your answers to one of those questions to somebody who's near you? If you prefer just to sit by yourself and be silent, go for that. But if you're willing to do it, would you just turn to somebody kind of somewhat near you and just give them one answer to one of your three questions? Just do that for just a moment, okay? You can talk even though you're in church. It's okay. You can talk. One of your questions, would I learn about God, about people, or about God's blessing? There's probably someone relatively near you. Just kind of turn to them just for a moment and just share one of your answers and maybe listen to their answer. All right, if you're talking to somebody and you get the idea that they would like to talk, kind of bring your words to a conclusion and say, what did you, what did you think? Or what is, what's, your, what's one of your answers? Give them a chance to speak to you for a moment. Okay, take about 10 more seconds and kind of conclude your, your sharing. Okay, so again, if you like the idea of that or if you'd be even more comfortable if you were kind of sitting around a table uh, with some other people, I invite you to come back today at 1230. So many different things that we could share. There. I'll just give you a couple of things that I was thinking about that if we had more time today, I would talk to you about each one of these things. You know, God determines truth. A really great, powerful lesson from this story. There's a lesson in my mind here about the fact that we must speak God's truth. We must be willing to speak God's truth, that we must refuse to be against what God is for. And that's a tough one today in our culture, isn't it? We must refuse to be against what God is for. We can say all kinds of things about that. Here's another one. We must refuse to compromise truth for money. Or to say it a different way, we must refuse to compromise truth for approval of others. These are all things that Balaam, right, had to journey through in his story in both negative and positive ways. Last thing for you, we must speak the truth in love. I have so many things I'd love to share with you about that, but let me say it again. We must speak the truth in love. But for time's sake, let me just take you to the end of Balaam's story and It does not appear in Numbers 22 or 23 or 24. If you've already read Numbers recently, you might know that Balaam peaks back up one more time in chapter 31. In chapter 31, Israel, these same people, are fighting against Midian, the same folks that are in our story today. And Israel basically has a huge victory just like Balaam had predicted. 
Among their victims that day were the five kings of Midian. And among their victims that day was a man named Balaam. Somehow or another, even though in Numbers 24, Balaam, it says that he goes home, there were some other things that he was busy doing. One of them was he ended back with these same people, the ones that he already pronounced out of his own mouth were not going to be victorious, and he ends up dying on the battlefield with them. But there's something else that Balaam did between Numbers 24 and the moment that he lost his life on the battlefield. And we know that because right there in Numbers 31, it says that there were women, Midianite women, who had, listen, followed Balaam's advice, and they had enticed the Israelites to be unfaithful to the Lord in what's called the Peor incident, so that a plague struck the Lord's people. I'm actually going to tell you a story next week about that, so come back to hear the details about that. But basically, Balaam advised these women to offer sex to the Israelite men to get them to worship their gods. And some really bad stuff happened because of that. So then, it, there's no surprise then that as we read Scripture, this is just the fourth book in the whole Bible, as we read the Bible, Balaam, when he pops back up, and believe me, he pops back up a lot, it's always in a don't be like Balaam sense, okay? He's never like, hey, this guy was awesome. In fact, if you read the story, 22, 23, 24, you almost kind of have a good sense, hey, this guy was kind of cool. Like, he'd, he didn't even really know Yahweh that much, but he kind of prophesied good things about Israel. He didn't sell out for money. He's a pretty, pretty decent guy. Until you read that story in Numbers 31, until you see what people that wrote the Bible had to say about him. I'm talking about the book of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Nehemiah, Micah, 2 Peter, Jude, Revelation. This dude gets brought up over and over again, and it's always a don't be like Balaam sense. Just to read you a couple of 2 Peter 2, we learned that Balaam, even though he sounds like a pretty cool guy in the chapters we read today, he actually loved the wages of unrighteousness, and he received a rebuke for his own transgression, even from a mute donkey, and so on. Jude tells us that we have to be careful that we don't rush headlong into the error of Balaam. In Revelation, John tells us there's a few things I want to say against you to a particular church. He says, there are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam. He's the one who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality, as I just mentioned. And then, of course, there's another person in the Bible who tries to buy God's favor. His name was Simon. You can read about him in Acts chapter 8. But what I want to close with today is that God will speak His truth through us even if we won't speak it willingly. Balak saw all that Israel had done and he requested a seer. Everybody know that word seer, someone who sees into the future. He requested a seer, and the seer couldn't even see the angel of the Lord when he was on his journey. The donkey could see him, but the seer couldn't even see what was right in front of him. The seer could only say what God told him to say, And God told him to say some pretty special things that I haven't told you about yet. And I'd like to end our message with some of these special, special things that came out of this man's mouth, who clearly was not a good dude. These amazing things that came out of this man's mouth as he was paid to curse Israel and refused to do so. One man said, A blind man may bear a torch in his hand, whereby others may receive benefit, though himself receive none. And that's exactly what happened with Balaam. I want to read you some of the words that God spoke through Balaam's mouth. Jewish commentators for thousands of years have seen Balaam's words and interpreted them as talking about 
the Messiah, the one who God would send to be the anointed one, the messenger, the messenger from God himself. I'm in chapter 24. I'll start with verse 2. By the way, one Syriac version of the Bible actually titles this section in the book of Numbers like this, the lesson of the epiphany of our Savior Jesus. Let me just say that again. They go back and they title it. It's so much about Christ, about the Messiah. They actually label it talking about the Savior. When Balaam looked out and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came on him and he spoke his message as a prophecy of one whose eye sees clearly. The prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate, and yet whose eyes are opened. The text here telling us there was no more pagan superstitions for Balaam. This is just straight God speaking to him and him speaking what he saw. And here's what he said. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, Israel. By the way, that little phrase right there to this day is still read in the synagogue at the beginning of their daily morning services. These words that came out of Balaam's mouth, so much from God that it's still used in Jewish worship today. Balaam then talks about the king of these people who will be, notice the future tense here, will be greater than a famous person from their day. Their kingdom, these people I'm looking at, will be exalted. And here's that phrase we already talked about earlier. May those who bless you be blessed, and may those who curse you be cursed. Let's skip ahead to chapter 24, verse 14. Now, I'm going back to my people. This is Balaam talking to Balak. But let me warn you about what this people will do to your people in the days to come. Hear the future present tense in the days to come. I see him, Balaam says, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob... A scepter will rise out of Israel. For thousands of years, the Jewish people have seen these words and received them as God speaking through this foreign prophet, talking about the Messiah who would come, who would be glorious like a star, and one who would have authority to rule, pictured by the scepter. The early Christian writers like Justin Martyr and Athanasius also saw this passage and said, oh man, this is a guy that's talking about what's to come. And it's so beautifully fulfilled in the story we know about Jesus Christ that Balaam is not done. He, this one that I'm seeing, who's bright and who's an authority, he's not here now, but I see him. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will go, grow strong. And listen, a ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. That language of crushing the head is how they talked about defeating one's enemy. So there's this victorious prophecy. A star, a glorious star, a mighty scepter, a king that would come as glorious as a star and with such great authority of a king and would conquer every enemy. A Messiah who would come and conquer every enemy, even death, even eternal punishment, even the power that the greatest addiction has in your life, even those who have felt cursed like Balak wanted his enemies to be. There is a blessing available to anyone online and here in this room today 
who will recognize that the Messiah, his name is Jesus Christ, is as bright and glorious as the brightest star you've ever beheld in the most open, clear night. And he has more authority than any person or entity you've ever been around in your entire life. He is both glorious and authoritative, and God the Father has sent him. So it was spoken even out of the mouth of a foreign seer. God sent him to be bright and glorious and authoritative and conquering of even death and hell and the power of the hardest thing that you're dealing with in your life right now. He sent him to be victorious. And I just want to invite you as uh, Nicole comes and joins me, I want to just invite you to spend the last few moments that we have together letting God remind you of what you learned about him and about people and about blessing. I want you to remember that God's blessing was promised to Abraham before Abraham did anything to deserve it. And that God said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to build you into a great nation. We learn later on that the reason that God continued that blessing is because Abraham had faith in God and God moved in his heart, not because Abraham earned his favor, but because God was willing to bless him. And God is willing to bless each and every person in this room, not because you've earned his blessing, but because he is a God who loves to pour out his blessing. The kind of blessings he poured out on Abraham, the kind of blessings he poured out on Israel, the kind of blessings he poured out through Jesus Christ, Israel's king, the kind of blessings that he would love to pour out into your life, even you who may have turned your back on God, who may not feel lovable, who may not feel like someone that God wants to bless, God would love to bless you. And so I invite you during this last moment, would you let God bring back to your mind and your heart what you've seen, what he's brought to your mind, and would you respond from your heart to God? We're going to remain seated during this last song for just a moment. Would you let God minister to you? Would you let God open you up fully? And would you respond in whatever way he might be leading you to respond? God has spoken even through the mouth of Balaam. He has spoken certainly through the mouth of his son, Jesus Christ, and now we must hear and respond this morning.